Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. So let's talk a little bit further about some of the common toxicities associated with cetuximab and your approach to clinical management of them. Okay, so when we give cetuximab, of course, the first thing that we always have to be aware of is that cetuximab can cause an anaphylactic reaction when it's administered. And the rate of anaphylactic reactions is highly variable depending on what part of the country you're in. So it's important to know what is the rate of anaphylaxis in your area and to plan accordingly. We, I happen to be in an area where there's a very high anaphylaxis rate so we, we do um, mini-dose um, administration before giving full dose when we start therapy. In areas of the country where the reaction rates are very low, that's not necessary. Um, there are um, common side effects that everybody sees, regardless of what area of the country you're in. Um, one of those toxicities, group of toxicities, are dermatologic toxicities. So classically, patients will get a macular rash, which, is do which dominates on the face, the neck, the chest, and the back. Um, the rash tends to subside over time, meaning over two to three months. Uh, however, when that rash is severe, when it's grade two, the rash can leave hyperpigmentation, which can be bothersome to patients. There are conflicting studies about the role of antibiotics at preventing that rash. It does appear that if the antibiotics don't decrease the overall incidence of rash, that it will decrease the severity. And in the, it, that, that can be very important to patients if the rash isn't as severe and, if, and, and by avoiding the severe rash, we can avoid some of the hyperpigmentation. That's a benefit to the patient. So many people will go ahead and, and put patients on prophylactic antibiotics. Um, and there are MASC, the Multinational Association for Supportive Care Cancer, um, has um, uh, recommendations on how to deal with the dermatologic toxicities. Rash is only one of the toxicities. So it's very important to be aware of the late toxicities as well for patients who are on um, cetuximab long term. Another toxicity that patients can um, have is hypomagnesemia. So patients may need to be placed on oral magnesium supplementation. Um, and if that does not maintain their magnesium sufficiently, they may need IV magnesium administration when they get their cetuximab infusion. All in all, um, cetuximab tends to be very well tolerated. When patients are on it for a protracted period of time, they may develop some of the other toxicities that we see with chemo, uh, fatigue, um, which generally is mild, but over time can uh, accumulate. Sometimes we'll see um, mucositis. The rate is very, very low, but it can occur. Um, and the uh, clinicians just need to be aware that these are possibilities. Can you elaborate a little bit on some of the common toxicities you see with cetuximab and how you approach the clinical management, maybe the role of your oncology nurse in your clinic? So uh, cetuximab, I would say its uh, uh, most concerning side effect is fortunately quite rare. Uh, a, uh, an infusion reaction occurs in just a few percent of patients, uh, and, uh, and so we obviously uh, monitor for that uh, and intervene. Uh, that can be managed uh, quite effectively. Uh, there's a, a small subset uh, geographically in the southeastern United States where that number, the frequency of that is higher, but really it's not a major clinical problem. Uh, the rash, the skin uh, derma dermatologic toxicities can be severe. Uh, grade uh, three uh, uh, skin rash, acneiform rash with cetuximab is well recognized, generally quite manageable with uh, topical uh, either uh, uh, steroids or uh, a uh, topical antibiotic, doxycycline for instance. Uh, in, uh, in the setting of uh, a manageable skin reaction, we continue the cetuximab. Uh, it's important to recognize that very rarely does that uh, lead to discontinuation. The patients are counseled, uh, the nurse monitors that, 
uh, and uh, topical uh, regimens are almost always uh, able to uh, quite effectively mitigate uh, this uh, skin rash, which does go away when the cetuximab uh, is discontinued at the end of therapy. We often counsel the patient uh, as well, which is quite reassuring, that the severity of the rash uh, may in fact, uh, may indeed tell us that it's having a better effect against the cancer, uh, and so patients tend to endure the rash when they think that the severity of it may actually predict a better outcome. So you mentioned uh, some of the toxicities associated with cetuximab. What are the most common toxicities, uh, particularly in the grade three, four toxicities? Yeah, the most common toxicity with cetuximab, of course, is inherent in, in its mechanism of action, and, and, that, and those are the skin toxicities. Most notable is the acneiform rash that develops with this drug, and, and truly any agent that targets EGFR, because it's a direct effect on the skin of EGFR inhibition. That occurs in the majority of patients. It occurs probably in the range of 70 to 80 percent of patients, but as we've become more skilled in managing the skin toxicities, we actually see now few patients with grade three and almost no patients with grade four skin toxicity. For some patients, uh, we have to uh, manage the dose. Uh, for many patients, we are now aggressive about the supportive care that we institute. For instance, uh, at the first sign of a rash, uh, we begin now tetracycline-based antibiotics. We begin topical uh, therapies such as clindamycin gel or um, moisturizing agents. And we tell patients, don't wait. As soon as you f see a rash or as soon as you feel a difference in your skin, please let us know because we're gonna start therapy. And when we started to do that, what we began to see was uh, really a, a dramatic drop in the number of grade three skin toxicities that we saw. The other adverse effect, uh, and sometimes that we worry about a little bit more because it can be difficult, a little bit more difficult to manage, is of course the infusion reactions. We have to remember that, uh, of course, cetuximab is a partially a mouse-based uh, antibody, it's a protein, and infusion reactions are going to happen. There's an area of the country in the United States where infusion reactions are more common. Uh, I don't actually practice in that area, and so our infusion reaction, serious infusion reaction rate is somewhere in the range of about three to five percent. We have to be prepared for it. We have to know that it can happen. We have to have the equipment uh, right next to the patient if it does happen to, to treat that toxicity. And of course, we need to manage subsequent doses if a patient develops it. Fortunately, it's rare. Fortunately, uh, there are ways to both acutely manage it and allow a patient to continue therapy if it does happen. And uh, in truth, uh, there are very few patients that we have to discontinue because of that. But of course, it's, it's something that does happen. The last toxicity that is worth mentioning for two reasons, first, because it's fairly common, and secondly, because it's easily managed, and if not managed, one can get into trouble, is hypomagnesemia. Again, hypomagnesemia is part of the mechanism of action of these drugs. It occurs because of the effect on these drugs on the kidney. And if you don't monitor it, if you don't manage it, patients can get into trouble with hypomagnesemia and become symptomatic. But on the other hand, if you're aware of it and, uh, and begin to replace patients aggressively if it develops, you can completely avoid any symptoms related to hypomagnesemia.